Well, I, when I was a kid, I was really into electricity and motors type of things. And in the junior high school I went to in the ninth grade, they had a, a class that was going to be half radio and half electricity. And I'm saying, oh, I don't want that radio stuff, but I'll take the class to get the, you know, the electricity things. And when the radio stuff came along, it was like a one-tube radio with vacuum tubes. And I said, whoa, this is cool stuff. And I was hooked just right then and there. And uh, I don't know how I went from that to getting my first amplifier, but I think it had something to do with that I, shortly after that I went back to Alabama for a summer visit with one of my aunts, and she gave me a, a 78 RPM record player that I, in a box. It was just a record player, not any electronics, and I brought it home, and I took an AC-DC radio, which is something that most people won't know what that means, <laughs> but suffice it to say, I took the amplifier section uh, of that and coupled this phono cartridge into it, and I took the speaker out of it, of this radio, and put it in an orange crate, and that was my first music playing system. Wow. <laughs> and then when I went to high school, uh, I started taking their, their radio shop every every year and, and I was making amplifiers and some of my friends and I, there was the uh, Santa Barbara County Jump was on the way to Henry's Beach, which is sort of south from where we live right here. And uh, the caretaker of that dump, he had a shack there and, and he would collect radios that people would you know throw away and they were all around his shack and we go out there in the middle of the night with our bikes and steal radios and bring them home and i'd make amplifiers out of it you know and so i, I had various things i in my bedroom uh in the, ho the house i was living with my mom and sister uh there was a closet a fairly big closet that had sliding doors and i built i i occupied that space with with my stereo and so I'd listen to music in there, and uh, it was kind of crazy. Yeah, and so when I graduated from high school, I discovered uh, my mentor, Gordon Mercer, who was opening a, a, a hi-fi store in town, and uh, I went to work for him for a year after uh, high school. And in the course of that uh, time, uh, he was a great audio engineer and taught me a lot of things, and he encouraged me to be a electrical engineer. In that period of time, so the next year I went up to California State Polytechnic College in San Luis Obispo and entered in a double E program. Actually, it was an EL, electronic engineering, as opposed to electric, electrical engineer, which there is a distinction. But most engineers that go and get a double E degree, you know, it, it applies to electronics depending on what they take. Sure. So that sort of got me started, and when I got out of that, uh, I, when I graduated, I came back to work with uh, a friend, another mentor, Mac W. M. Turner, and got involved with uh, his company that made uh, equipment for a ground station uh, communication with rockets. And uh, that, after that, I went uh, to another company uh, shortly thereafter to call Applied Magnetics uh, that made uh, magnetic recording heads. And the principals of that company um, uh, had a geophysical re uh, exploration background. So they were making recording drums and so forth for those systems. And about the time that I came to work there, they had opened an instrument division to make special purpose tape recorders. And, I ended up by making uh, the electronics for quite a few of different, very widely varying machines, you know, for maybe a four or five year period. And I left that company and went to work for Mac Turner again uh, in his astrometrics research uh, division. And he had an idea, a patent actually, for a, a servoed loudspeaker that actually worked by uh, s sensing, he would coat the cone with colloidal graphite make it conductive and therefore the change in this movement of that cone to the basket was a variable capacitance. So it was like a condenser microphone if you will. So it was a displacement sensor of the three variables of motion, displacement, uh, velocity and acceleration. Uh, that was a displacement sensor and it was sort of valid. <laughs> you know there was a lot of leakage you know you would get some legitimate low frequency feedback but as you went up in frequency leakage would convert it to just plain you know a crosstalk but it all blended within the circuitry to where the base was uh, servo then it came into the rest of the range just to be regular amplifier so we made some of those speakers uh, as a product and I 
was charged with taking a pair of them in Max Lincoln Continental down to dealers in Los Angeles to try to place them, you know, and get people to buy them. And in one of those visits, Mac happened to come with me, and we ended up by going to Woodland Stereo, which was a fairly famous hi-fi shop in the Valley. And lo and behold, Arnold Nudell was there at the same time uh, because that was an outlet for him. Uh, uh, he had the prototype servostatics going there. And so we looked at each other like, whoo, what's this? <laughs> and we, we became friends pretty quickly and went up to his house, and that's how I met Arnold before he ever started Infinity. And um, after, uh, as I was telling Paul a while ago, somewhere around 1967, I was working for a company called Optron making a displacement measuring device. And their chief engineer had died in a car accident and I got hired to make this product work. And the company uh, had, was gonna move to New Haven, Connecticut. And I didn't wanna go live there, obviously. But I went back there for a couple of months to help them out. And in the course of that uh, t absence, my wife had this very laboratory built for me. So when I came back, I basically put out my shingle as a consultant. And I, I worked for a lot of different uh, companies, BGWs, Marantz. Marantz was an interesting one. When they, a Superscope bought them, they were going to move out to Sun Valley. And Dawson Hadley of Hadley Laboratories, another luminary in the business, uh, I had met him through Gordon Mercer because he would bring his products up to AudioVision to sell. And he wanted me to uh, consult with them. So he said, come on down to this factory and we'll talk about it. And I went down there. The place was totally empty, bare. So I saw that whole place before he started making the subsequent Marantz products there. And I, I designed a number of concept ideas for him, you know, with the preamp equalizers and different preamp circuits. And at one point, I got a commission to design a, a fully, you know, an integrated amplifier that became the Model 1120. And that was a was an interesting device because I made that output stage quasi complementary, as opposed to the complementary approach that was being used pretty widely at that point. But I, I wanted this other way, and it was the only product that Marantz ever made. It was quasi, but it sounded good, you know, and it was a nice little product. And at some point, uh, I was also a reviewer for Audio Magazine through this period of time. I, I reviewed a lot of amps and preamps and things and, and digital things. And at one point, Jim Bongiorno had uh, come to work for SAE, and he had designed several amps, one among them, the 3CM, and audio was going to to review that and I was going to be the reviewer and Bongiorno was going to bring it up to me physically to, to get. Well one afternoon this Buick Riviera pulls up <laughs> to the same place that you have your vehicle Paul, you know, a light blue Buick Riviera and out steps this gentleman in a total yellow suit, yellow hat, yellow, <laughs> yellow shoes and I says, oh my god, what is this? <laughs> Jesus. Jim so, Dandy. Jim Dandy. He was, you know, and so we brought his amplifier in. At the time, I had a really a nice uh, set of tube amps that were uh, designed and built by an a English professor, a good friend of, of, of uh, Gordon Mercer's, and I really liked those amps, you know, and bon John, I had an A-B switching arrangement, so we hooked up Jim's amplifier, and I got it all working to where we could flip between the two, and we started listening, and I'm saying, oh, God, one of these sounds much better better to me than the other and I'll bet you that it's the tube amp and so I says well look Bon Giorno, I'm gonna shut your amp off the music I'm gonna keep playing it 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 didn't it was his amp I was stunned I says oh man how is this me <laughs> and so at one point though I was uh, you know pretty energetic as a poor man I remember uh, saying well I well, was kind of crazy but I was jumping up and down on top of his amplifier to say this is pretty goddamn strong I can't do this with the tube amp but I said here's the one thing you can do with the tube amp I started pulling the output tubes on it while it was playing you know bam didn't hurt a damn thing but you couldn't pull output transistors like that and <laughs> so that started a great long-term relationship with Mr. Bongiorno who was a dear friend uh, and we spent a lot of over the years commiserating and at some point he got gas going you know he, he left SAE and and put out the Ampzilla as a kit first and uh, 
I think the company was going along for maybe six months, a year, and he made a proposition to me one time that uh, he asked me if I would come down for two or three days a, a, a week and be his chief engineer. Now, the notion of living and going to Los Angeles was always horrifying to me. I, I, I don't like the place. You know, but I said, gee, two or three days a week, part-time? I might be able to do that. You know, all right. And, of course, I was doing some consulting with Infinity at this time, and I knew Arnold really well at this point. And I said, Arnie, you know, uh, Jim offered me this position. Uh, it's kind of an interesting proposition. Would you like me on the same basis? And he said, yes. And I immediately said, I'll go with you. Uh, I did a lot of things there, uh, all the electronics. Uh, I made several FET preamplifier designs that we used for shows, but we never produced. And we made uh, the wonderful hybrid class A. Uh, power amplifier, and I did all of the servo electronics for all speakers that had active woofers during that time, and there were a lot of different designs. And uh, other jobs after that, you know, I, I consulted for Gas and Sumo and BGW and Counterpoint, did things for Mike Elliott, and uh, leading on to later uh, with Conrad Johnson. I designed uh, Premier 350 amp idea for them, and on to I uh, did work for Constellation Audio and PS Audio over the years, and and presently I'm still reviewing things and measuring uh, amps and preamps for Soundstage magazine, that sort of thing. I'm still doing this.